hi, my name is Mignon Lo, and I'm a pediatric hematologist oncologist, so I have my MD degree, and I am currently division chief of pediatric hematology oncology at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. You know, I think when I actually first started my interest in medicine, it actually grew through my love of science. And I was like little, I was, I think I was 12 years old. And I just was kind of fascinated by the quantitative aspects of um, sort of scientific inquiry, even though we were still so young, I had some really motivating teachers who introduced me to like, I know it sounds crazy, I was 12 years old, to like genetic engineering at that time it was called, like DNA and RNA, and I just thought it was really fascinating that we were all sort of the same but so different, and that we could study our genes um, to tell us about ourselves. And then I grew to more sort of more practical aspects of it um, and uh, decided to go into medicine and hopefully some science. Yeah, so when you asked me about um, how I found myself in majoring in art history in college but still going into medicine, I think for me, I've always just been a really curious learner and I've not always taken the easy way through things. Um, and, I, and I know that when I decided to major in art history, I already knew that I wanted to be a physician. I didn't know that I actually want, was gonna end up being a scientist as well. But at the time I decided to, to major in art history because you know who doesn't like beautiful things, but um, I kind of liked history and I also wanted to learn how to write. So I, I was an okay writer, but I really wanted to hone that craft. And I figured if I were going to go into medicine, then I wouldn't really have a time when I could really focus on my writing skills. And that kind of communication on paper has always been really important to me. So that's a large part of why I decided to major in art history. And I think a lot of people who have MDs and who do research, especially in um, a laboratory or on a wet bench, or even now on a dry bench, call themselves physician scientists. And, and I would just stress that in my opinion, a physician scientist doesn't necessarily have to be restricted to an MD or an MD PhD who does work um, on the bench. Um, I think that there's lots of different sort of scientific careers that we can carve out. And I realized as I was doing my training that first year of my fellowship, um, the patients that I was uh, treating had super interesting diseases some of which were modeled in a laboratory. They must be telling us something about their disease just by having this disease. We must be able to study their DNA or their RNA and find interesting things out. And I got into the lab and I just really enjoyed what I was doing. And it was mostly patient-oriented research. Again, um, looking at uh, tissue samples from patients and making observations about their specific types of leukemia and then correlating that with outcome. And I felt like that was a really interesting space to be in at that time. And for me, in the 1990s, what I was interested in is, you know, could we learn something from patient samples um, in the laboratory and then translate those findings back um, to uh, the clinic. So that's what I think of as translation, is just you know, a very um, coordinated effort between the bedside and the bench, and then back again. The, the path to being a physician scientist can be really challenging, and there are lots of different ways to get there. But I will say, I think it's important um, that you keep an open mind and that you're curious, and that you actually identify um, a project that you're really interested in because you have to be interested in what you're doing, otherwise there's no point. And hopefully it's in a lab where there's a mentor who has a track record of turning out people who um, are physician scientists who have had uh, K awards, which are generally viewed as uh, federal funding that um, so, sort of identifies people with promise to be independent investigators um, and, and that you keep your, open, your mind open, you know, and you just, you do your work and that you don't stop at just the project you write about, but that you always look for what the next question is going to be and how you might answer that. And if it also means reaching out for other mentors or collaborators, I would encourage you to do that. It was 15 years <laughs> between the time I graduated from Bryn Mawr through your, four years, that was my undergrad institution, uh, through four years of med school. So I didn't take any time off between uh, college and med school. So then I did my medical school in four years, and then I went straight into residency. Like, that's a hard time to take a break, right? So you, you do your residency in pediatrics, was three years. 
And then I actually did take a year off after I finished my general pediatric residency. And then I went to my fellowship at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston Children's Hospital. And I did um, three years of a formal fellowship. So every fellowship has a different trajectory. And it just turns out that the peds hemonc um, is three years. So it's the first year is clinical. And then the second two years have a little bit of clinic, um, clinical responsibilities as well as your research. And then I stayed for one more year beyond that as an instructor. I certainly took out some loans uh, during medical school, but I largely um, graduated with, um, you know, a, a, a reasonable amount of debt. And then the way I took care of that was, you know, there are also when you do some subspecialty training, and it, de it really depends on the kind of specialty you're going into, the NIH has a loan repayment program for um, people who are pursuing research interests in, um, uh, in academics. And so you can participate and get part of your loans, a good chunk of your loans paid off while you're engaged in that research. So that, that was great. And to be honest, that was also another reason why I took a year off. Um, you know, between my residency and my fellowship, um, I was not exempt from paying off my loans during that time. Um, but that's okay, because I was making this locum tenens, you know, attending level salary. So I tried to get a big chunk of it out of the way that, that year as well. I think a big obstacle um, is funding. I think that uh, I continuously deal with challenges uh, for my funding stream. And I can't really give great advice except that you should be writing a grant all the time and maybe more than one. It's really hard to keep that energy and optimism up when you get rejection after rejection after rejection. But then something hits and then it's like, oh, Okay. Well, I think that that's been the greatest obstacle is trying is feeling the anxiety and dealing with the anxiety of knowing that you have enough money until X year and then what's going to happen. So the steps to getting my faculty position um, really started with me getting a fundable score on my K award because once I got that score in academics, people love it when you come with some funding, especially for your salary. Um, and it sounds a bit strange, but medicine is a funny field. It's not like business. It's not like law. It's not like you just get a salary. It's like frequently in academic medicine, you have to generate your own salary. So when you get a major grant that um, has long legs to it, like five years, you are a very marketable um, candidate. Sussing out job opportunities for your partner is important if you have a partner. And then again, um, looking at the potential, looking at the environment. So, you know, for me, it really came down just to two places in the Bay Area. And uh, luckily, they both had positions open. And, um, you know, that's just what sort of how I looked, looked at it. And then I also asked, you know, when you started to put, when I started to put my foot in the door, you know, having your, your folks back at your home institution, you know, advocate for you behind the doors or, you know, giving you good sort of not, I mean, they gave me fine letters of recommendation, but also being able to pick up with the phone and say, you know, I really think she's got potential here. You know, one of the really rewarding things is when I see somebody who I knew was really, really sick uh, when they were first diagnosed and I see them as a survivor, like that's incredibly rewarding with their families, you know. Um, it's personally scary when you're dealing with sick kids. And so when you can try again um, with a team-based approach to, to direct um, their therapy and to see them come out on the other end is just like, that's the best, right? That's why I'm a doctor. Um, I also think it's really rewarding to marry my science with the doctor part and use new technologies to make observations for our patients that can be really helpful. So, you know, one of the diseases I study was a very difficult diagnosis to make, and it was through our genetic sequencing work that we made it more easy for people to diagnose these patients. And so we get a lot of referrals now because of some of the discoveries we've made, and that's incredibly rewarding as well. What's challenging is, um, again, with our patients, it's challenging when they relapse and they progress and their diseases don't respond to the things we think they should respond to. And it can also be frustrating when we know that we've made a discovery in the lab and we can't yet apply it to a patient because there's a big jump between taking that laboratory result and turning it into a clinical test that can then be actually used for a patient. And the other thing is sometimes we can't get the drugs for our pediatric patients. And that's exceedingly frustrating because we know it should work 
we just need our hands on the drug and the drug companies won't cooperate. I think that um, you have to find a couple people who you can trust in the field, even if they don't study exactly the same like molecule you want to study, but just people whose careers you respect and who seem to have made some good choices, who are, you know, kind, decent people who can give you some honest advice that you will listen to and also recognizing when things are going well versus when things are not going well and when you might have to sort of readjust your expectations. Like not being fixated on one thing, I think is important and I don't think lessens your commitment. So I think that sometimes when you're young, I think that, you know, you're worried about being unfocused, but at the same time, you know, you've got a lot of years ahead of you. So it's okay to cast about a little bit. The one thing that's really important is, you know, you're interested in be becoming a physician scientist and that is terrific, but please, you have to find what you're passionate about because if you don't, it'll never work and you shouldn't waste your time. Just be honest with yourself, like what you really want to do. Mm -hmm.